medical schools do not just look at that final number, that cumulative number or that science GPA number and go, this is who you are. Ask Dr. Gray pre-med Q&A brought to you by Blueprint MCAT. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful. What can I help you with? All right. So essentially my question is, should I do an SMP or any other type of master's program before applying to medical school, um, given my undergrad GPA and a couple other factors? Or should I just try to really kill the MCAT and gain some more experience and just apply? Yeah. So let's talk about what your GPA is. I don't know what that is. Uh, But I will preface everything else that follows this discussion with an MCAT does not make up for a poor GPA. So my undergraduate GPA is a 3.36 cumulative with a 3.13 science, so not great. Okay, um, what does the great upward trend. trend look like? So I started out at a 3.0 and I got up to a 3.62. Um, and then COVID hit and I went back down to a 3.3 for my last semester. Okay, so, I kinda so you don't have a great end. upward trend. Um, yes. <laughs> all right, so so uh, went right back down, unfortunately. So... Um, yeah, so you, you need a post back or an SMP. So my um, concern with a post back is that I kind of already took all of the classes that would be on a post back. And I feel like with how many credits I have, it just wouldn't really move my GPA that much. Yeah. I don't think. So, so let, let's, let's start with a clarification. When I talk about doing an SMP, it is almost never to reach a certain GPA. The goal of an SMP is to be as close to a 4.0 as possible for as long as possible. Even if your final cumulative GPA and your final science GPA number is a 3.0, I don't care. Even if you have a thousand credits, your denominator is so big that your GPA will never move, the goal is still as close to a 4.0 for as long as possible. And that typically means 30, 40, sometimes 50 credits at a 4.0. That is what medical schools are looking for to show this difference of pre post back and post post back, right? Uh, of here's the student I was, here's the student I am. Medical schools do not just look at that final number, that cumulative number or that science GPA number and go, this is who you are. It's this big kind of thing that students don't understand that it's not just one number. Medical schools sort and filter and have every single data point at their disposal when it comes to reviewing students and determining for each medical school which one of these students is academically capable of doing well in our program. So then my question would be, do you think it matters if it's a special master's program or just any master's I'm interested in? I've just gotten some conflicting advice yeah, from doctors I work with. Not, not necessarily. The, the one benefit that a special master's program has, depending on which one you do, is that some of them are kind of intertwined with the medical school so that basically you're a first year medical student and if you go to one of those programs and you get as close to a 4.0 as possible which is really really hard in medical school uh then applying to schools they're like oh like you did well during your first year of medical school that you're just going to repeat again when when you get to medical school and so (laughs) it gives them confidence that you're likely going to do fine so that's one benefit of an SMP. Another benefit of an SMP is our, our linkage uh, agreements that they have with other schools, whether it's an automatic interview or even an automatic acceptance, depending on how you do GPA and MCAT wise. So the first step potentially is looking at undergraduate level courses because medical schools by and large seem to like undergraduate GPA improvement better than a master's program. If it has to be a master's program because you truly think there's just no more classes for you to take, or 
for financial reasons, getting financial aid for master's programs is easier, <laughs> as in you can is, do yeah. it, uh, compared to a post back program, then that's just the route you have to take. And you'll just have to understand that some medical schools won't like that as much. But if you apply broadly enough, it shouldn't be a big issue. Do you, I know you've spoken before about how you don't like the master's programs that require An you to MCAT. take the MCAT. Right? Yeah. It, it seems like it's all of them. I'm having trouble finding any that don't require it. Yeah, it pisses me off. Yeah, and, but, and it, it's just, it's the game. It's the game, it's the game that they all play. It's the same game that pre-health committees play. When they say, we're only going to give you a letter if you have a competitive GPA and a competitive MCAT score. And and just this past weekend, as we're recording this, I was tweeting and, and commenting that there's a school in New York that has their competitive level for their pre-health committee letter at a five freaking 14. That's the MCAT that you need to get a letter from this committee. And I just wanted, my, my, my head exploded. I'm like, on on whose like reality is a 514 competitive? Like a 514 is fantastic. A 508 is competitive. A 505 is getting closer to not competitive, but still good enough for a lot of schools. 514, it's a game that they all play to go, well, we just want to make sure that uh, when you finish our program here at this SMP, that you're going to do well on your MCAT and, and GPA so that you're going you're gonna to get into medical school so that we can say that 95% of our students get into medical school. Mm-hmm. Like, no, you shouldn't worry about marketing language. You should be worried about helping the students who need the help. Yeah, I agree. That's crazy. I just, I don't... I mean, obviously, I'd love to get a 514, but I would hope I can be competitive without that. (laughs) Yes, you can be. It's shocker. I know lots of students who get in without any problem with much less than a 514. Yeah, it pisses me off. I don't really make up for my GPA, but I do do hope to get somewhere near there, but I don't know. I haven't taken the MCAT yet. That is the one downfall of... uh, SMP programs and master's programs specifically catering to pre-health students is that they want an MCAT score. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's Do you just think it the would game. Be bad to just, would it be bad to just take it just so I can get in, even knowing that I'm probably not going to get the greatest score? Well, you'll have to, it's, it's not bad to just take it. Like there, there's no issue with you taking the, the test, getting a score that's good enough to get into a program, and then retaking it once you have a better foundation to build on for a better score. That's not my issue with, with doing it. My issue is that it costs several hundred dollars to take the stupid test. It probably shortens your life by many years, just the stress involved with taking the stupid test. And so, like, what's the point? Other than to check a box that says, I took the stupid MCAT. Yeah, that seems like the only reason that I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> yeah. But um, I did have another question. Okay. <laughs> um, so I did not have any shadowing experience through all of undergrad. And I know that looks really bad. Um, I don't have any particular excuse for it. It just, I didn't make it a priority. I didn't have any kind of connections to um, make it easy for me. So I just didn't. Um, and I have very recently set up some shadowing opportunities now that I've already graduated. Okay. And I just kind of wanted to hear your advice on kind of how that looks and just what else I can do to make sure that I still make it mean enough that medical schools will see that I really do care about um, ensuring that this is the right profession and that I know what I'm getting myself into. Yeah. Despite well, not starting it early enough. Well, luckily you're doing a master's program or something else, so you still have lots of time before you apply. So okay. keep up with getting as much time as you can get moving forward and don't worry about what happened in the past. You can't change it. And silver lining, not a lot of people got shadowing experience during the pandemic, which we're still in, by the way. <laughs> So that's that's yeah, a silver lining. I just lining. signed up for the e shadowing with you. Just signed up. I've been doing it for two years. What have you been waiting for? 
I know. I know. <laughs> That's okay. But, so, um, so before you move on to your next question, one thing I want to make sure I get uh, out mm-hmm. there because it's a very common mistake that students make because they're in a rush, is I highly recommend whatever program you go to, whether it's an undergrad uh, post-bac, whether it's a master's level post-bac, is that you finish the post-bac before you apply. You finish the SMP before you apply. Too many students will do one semester of their SMP and then apply hoping that they can update schools with their kind of progress moving forward, whether that's that fall semester and the following spring semester going into the the next year. If you're doing an SMP, if you're doing a post-bac, the goal is to show that you're academically capable. Don't apply to medical school until you have shown that on your transcript, which typically means when you're done which is going to add time to your timetable, to your calendar, but it's the the smartest way to do it. Hey, honestly, through the whole process, I've just kind of tried not to focus on getting it all done in the normal time frame, just because I really, I don't mind being, I kind of want to be in school for as long as possible. Yeah. Um, Just due to some unique circumstances, I didn't really start school at all until I was like 15. So I just really... Like, feel like I was behind. I want to get as much time in school as I can. And I was worried that that looks like I haven't um, put enough effort into getting everything done when I should to make sure that I'm ready to apply in that particular time frame. There's, there's no, no? T- there's no set timetable out there. So take your time, do what you need to do, have fun, soak it all in. And uh, don't don't worry that your path is not the traditional path. Would you say that would make me a non-traditional applicant just to have um, different circumstances where I ended up taking a really weird, long, winding route to applying to medical school? Potentially. I, I don't know if there's any strict definition of who's non-traditional. I think the, the majority of people will say, oh, non-traditional is if you literally don't apply to medical school your junior year and start medical school right after you graduate from undergrad. If you don't do that, then you're non-traditional. But I think non-traditional comes in many different flavors. And if just hearing you say you didn't start school until 15 for whatever circumstances you were in, like that's pretty non-traditional and potentially goes into a disadvantaged essay um, on the application where you'll have 1,325 characters to tell that story and give context to everything else on your journey. So that was another thing I was going to ask because I wasn't sure if that would count as disadvantaged and I didn't really want to write an essay that kind of sounded like, oh, poor me instead of an actual <laughs> every, know, disadvantage every, to me sounds like... Every student is concerned about, oh, me, poor me, oh, oh you're going to pity me, blah, blah, blah. Like, it... it I've never seen an essay where I'm like, whoa, like this is way too over the top and you're just looking for someone's pity. The disadvantaged essay, I have kind of reclassified in, the, in my language as the context essay. It, give, it gives context to the journey that you've been on. Even if you have perfect grades, you can still be disadvantaged. Even if you come from lots of money, you can be disadvantaged. There's, there's no strict definition, and it's one of the good things that the AAMC does. Even though they give some guidelines on what disadvantaged means, and it's typically around underserved areas, like, oh, you grew up in an underserved area. Like, to me, that's the least disadvantaged out there. It's like, oh, I grew up around not a lot of doctors and hospitals, therefore I'm disadvantaged. Like, I know lots of people in this world who have lots more disadvantages than just, oh, the nearest hospital was two hours away. So yeah, the double AMC doesn't limit who can mark themselves as disadvantaged. It's up to you to go, you know what? I have not led a typical life. I have not had the typical resources as a standard typical pre-med student. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to mark yes, I'm disadvantaged, and I'm going to tell you in my 1,325 characters why. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I, I do have um, a thousand more questions, but um, yeah. I wanted to ask, I 
kind of related to the shadowing question. I just didn't have clinical experience either um, until I graduated. And I do have now about nine months of almost full-time just clinical experience. Um, And I really do think that I can show how I definitely want to be um, a physician and not any other position in healthcare. And Mm -hmm. I just, um, again, I guess I've just, all my questions are, does this look bad? But <laughs> yeah, you, you, just need to, you just need to stop worrying about whether it looks bad and just embrace that it's your journey. It's your story. Okay. That's all. I don't, I think that was all my questions, honestly. All right. I well. just really wanted to get your opinion on um, the post back and what I should do. Yeah. Well, there's, there are lots of paths, not any of them or all of them are going to be right or wrong for you. So just figure out what the best path is for you and don't worry about what if, or how's this going to look or whatever, right? The goal is to show that you're academically capable and ready for medical school. And you have clinical experience and shadowing to, to prove to yourself that this is what you want and prove to medical schools that this is what you want. And yeah, put it all together in an application and uh, you go from there. And if we can help you with application stuff, I have a team that that can help you with that Um, or read my books and watch my videos. And there's plenty of information out there for free to to help you as well. I I really appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions and um, I really value your advice. No problem. And don't forget, when it comes time, we haven't discussed the MCAT at all, the silly little test called the MCAT. Go sign up for a free Blueprint MCAT account at blueprintmcat.com. I will. All right. Good luck to you. Fingers crossed. All right. Uh, Thank you, Doc. Embrace, embrace, embrace your journey.